Breaking tonight, what could be a key development in the effort to track Islamic State terrorists being recruited inside the United States. As we learn of a hunt for a mystery man who may have been spreading a dangerous message in, once again, a Minnesota mosque. Welcome to The Kelly File, everyone. I'm Megan Kelly. The shocking report broke just hours ago. The Al Farouk Youth and Family Center reportedly calling the police this summer, asking them to remove this man here, a 31-year-old with a deeply troubling background who mosque leaders suspected of spreading radical Islamic ideology. This is a community already on edge. We learned last month that two young Minneapolis men died while fighting for ISIS and their terrorists in Iraq and Syria. And they are not the only ones. Now there's a missing 19-year-old Minneapolis woman. She reportedly also attended that very same mosque. And she, too, is believed to have joined the terrorists. Fox News reporter Tom Lydon is in Minneapolis, where he just broke this story. Tom, thank you for joining us tonight. And so what do we know about this man, Amir Mashal? Megan, this may just be the guy who can connect the dots for us here in Minnesota. 31-year-old Amir Mashal was known to hang out at the Al Farouk Youth and Family Center. It is one of the largest mosques here in the Twin Cities. He had no job, yet he always had money. But in June, the mosque kicked him out, called police, and got a no trespass order. Police report says the mosque was concerned about Mashal interacting with their youth. The director of Al Farouk tells me Mashal was heard proselytizing a radical Islamist jihadist ideology. So so they blew the whistle on him. Now, some of the 15 who have traveled from Minnesota to Syria that, that you mentioned to fight for ISIS, including a 19-year-old girl, some of them attended al Farouk, And we learned late tonight that a family member even identified Mashal as a recruiter. Now, here is the fascinating backstory on him. In 2007, Mashal was arrested in Kenya after leaving a terror camp, a terror training camp in Somalia. The FBI thought he was al-Qaeda. We were talking about al-Qaeda then, not al-Shabaab. And they interrogated him some 30 times. Times. He was shuffled between jails in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Somalia, the so-called rendition. Then, after three months, they dropped him back into the U.S., his native New Jersey, without any criminal charges whatsoever. The ACLU filed a lawsuit on his behalf, which was dismissed just a couple months ago. But in that lawsuit, an interesting nugget, Michelle claims the FBI even tried to turn him into a government informant by promising to take him off the no-fly list, which leaves a lot of people here wondering, Megan, if this is a recruiter for ICE, is he some kind of informant for the FBI? Is he both? No one really seems to know. And the FBI won't comment tonight on our story. And get this, we have no idea where this guy is tonight. Has he been seen in any other mosques in the area, do we know? That's a good question. In fact, what the director at Al Farouk told me is uh, the quick answer is no. We don't know if he has been spotted in any mosque. But the director of Al Farouk says they're puzzled. They don't know why this guy that they've had problems with, they called the police on him. They don't know why the FBI hasn't arrested him. And they don't know why other mosques aren't on the lookout for him or have, have filed a no trespass order. We do know that the local police department it was Bloomington, a suburb here of the Twin Cities. We do know they gave his name and all their information to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Of course, we have no idea what happened with that after that. Wow. Uh, great reporting, Tom. Thank you so much, Tom Lydon, everybody. Joining sure. us now for more, Buck Sexton, the national security editor of TheBlaze.com, a former CIA officer and a former NYPD intelligence division specialist. How does a guy who gets arrested after being in Somalia, Ethiopia, and Kenya, interrogated more than 30 times by the FBI, get brought back to the United States? Who brings him back here? Well, the truth is that he there might not have been a criminal case that they could prove. And that's why they what? would release him back onto the streets here. He's a U.S. citizen. If they if they had a case, one would assume they would have brought it. But, Megan, this is emblematic of the very problem we face now, which is that you can have individuals here who have essentially espoused very radical views, direct support for jihad in rhetorical terms. That's not necessarily illegal. And it's even hard to prove when it goes beyond the bounds of what would be considered legally uh, legal if you're going to give actual material support to a terrorist group. This is happening not just here at this mosque. This is happening around the country right now. What you're hearing about in the news in terms of recruitment for ISIS in America is the tip of the iceberg. It is a much broader problem than anybody's yet able to realize. Isn't this exactly what we asked mosque leaders to do after 9-11? Pay attention, listen, alert the authorities if you hear someone getting radicalized. And we talked about this after the Boston Marathon bombing as well. So this mosque does it. They call the police. They say, we're worried about this guy. He's talking about jihad and radical Islamist ideology. They say, we have no patience for this. He, he is trespassing. They want him arrested. It doesn't happen. And now we've lost him. I mean, Buck, this is 
this is the kind of thing that really outrages people. And if this guy resurfaces doing something really bad, people are going to wonder who missed it. At this point, he may just be spreading Salafist, hardliner, extremist ideology, but that's not enough. That's First to, Amendment that's, speech. That's not enough to hold him, to detain him. And, and what you're seeing here is a situation where, yes, mosques sometimes do point out these uh, rabble rousers, individuals that are spreading stuff that is violent and extremist, uh, but they can still use these individuals. We call them spiritual sanctu sanctioners. When I was at the NYPD Intelligence Division, they can still use the mosque as a recruiting ground. They find the disaffected people in the mosque. They look for somebody who's upset, who's angry, who's speaks a bit about how they want to wage war against Israel, the United States. Then they seize upon them and they say, you don't have to just talk about this in rhetorical terms. I'll put you in touch with some people. Because he then was going you, to the young people. That's what the mosque reported, that, that he, they didn't want him exposed to their young people because that's who he was targeting. That's exactly the kind of recruitment you would want in that sort of situation. You want someone who's young, disaffected, minds that are easily molded towards jihadization, which is also a term we used to use. It's very difficult, though, to catch people in that process from indoctrination into a jihadization, into actually taking action well, and deciding and, to and go and to the problem is we have free, free, free speech rights, freedom of expression rights in this country. And if he was being harassed for just having these thoughts or, or offering you know, his views on it, that's probably why the ACLU stepped in. The, the details are scant, but it looks like a lawsuit was filed on his behalf by the ACLU. Uh, and lo and behold, now we've, we've lost track of him. We the don't ones, know where he is. The ones that we're finding out about, Megan, are the ones who have poor OPSEC, bad operational security. They're blabbing about how they're going to go fight with ISIS. They're doing something that's a mistake along the way. There are many more that aren't making those mistakes, that are getting to Turkey, that are getting to other countries in the region, getting on a flight the U.S. doesn't know about, and bam, all of a sudden, they're jihadi. And the goal is to stop them from coming back into the United States, which is legislation that is act actually being challenged by some. Buck, good to see you. We're actually going to talk about that on Monday night. Well, we first told you last night about a man from Boston also suspected of ties to this terror group ISIS. Now, after more digging, Fox News has turned up possible links between this man and other Americans believed to have joined the ranks of jihad. Catherine Herridge, our chief intelligence correspondent, has those new details. Catherine? Well, thank you, Megan. Federal